Hi guys, my name is Siobhan Fallon. Welcome back to Custer's 7th Cavalry. Today we're going to discuss the life of Custer's favorite scout, the half Arikara half Sioux Bloody Knife. Bloody Knife remains one of the most famous Native American scouts who served with the United States Army. Bloody Knife also had a three decade long hatred, murderous hatred, between himself and the Hunkpapa Sioux warrior Gaul, which culminated at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Let's learn more, guys. Thanks again for joining me. Bloody Knife was born in the late 1830s, which made him about the same age as George Custer, as well as a certain Hunkpapa Sioux Gaul. Bloody Knife's mother was an Arikara or Re, and his father was a Hunkpapa Sioux. He was raised in the same hunk papa village as Gaul. Gaul was named Gaul, or Pizzy, after he ate the gall bladder of a freshly killed buffalo. Gaul's father had been killed when he was very young, so another youth in the village, who was nine years older, took the boy under his wing. That young man who treated Gaul as a younger brother was Sitting Bull. The Arikara and the Sioux had a long history of violent tribal warfare. We don't know if Bloody Knife's parents married during a time of rare peace and tranquility, or if his mother was a captive taken during a raid on an Arikara village. But we do know that Bloody Knife's mother, as well as Bloody Knife himself and his siblings, were relentlessly discriminated against and bullied in the Hunk Papa village. Bloody Knife's worst tormentor was Gaul. Bloody Knife's mother just couldn't handle it any longer. In the 1850s, she took her children, including the teenage Bloody Knife, and returned to her people near Fort Clark. Fort Clark was a major trading post on the upper Missouri, about 35 miles northwest of present-day Bismarck, where many Arikara settled before joining with the Hidasta and the Mandan. Around 1860, Bloody Knife went to visit his father at the Hunkpapa village where he grew up at the mouth of the Rosebud River. He arrived at the village and as a guest in good faith, he thought he'd be protected and welcomed by his father and his relatives. Well, he was wildly wrong. Gaul and his warrior band seized him and they stripped him, they beat him, they whipped him with coup sticks until blood ran down his back. And then they told him to leave immediately or they'd kill him. Bloody Knife's younger brothers would not be this lucky. Two years later, in the autumn of 1862, the two teenagers were on a hunting trip when they were attacked by a Sioux raiding party. They were killed, scalped, and their bodies were cut into pieces and left for the wolves. Gaul, supposedly, was the leader of those warriors who killed the boys. Soon after, Bloody Knife would have his own opportunity for revenge. Let's take a moment here to do a brief history about the tribal conflict that existed between the Arikara and the Sioux. These conflicts impacted U.S. Indian relationships and treaties and also played a role in the Battle of the Little Bighorn. The name Arikara is believed to mean horns in reference to the ancient custom of wearing two upright bones in their hair. The name also could mean elk people or corn eaters. The Arikara had been a mighty people. They were semi-nomadic. In addition to hunting, they grew corn, beans, squash, and they lived in earth lodges along the Missouri River. In 1760, the Arikara numbered about 30,000 people. Their most bitter enemy was the Sioux. The Arikara dominated over the Missouri River in both trade and movement. They were the most influential and affluent tribe of the Northern Plains. For a while, they were so powerful, they were able to stop the Sioux from even crossing the Missouri River. The Sioux in 1805, in comparison, numbered only about 8,500 people. The Arikara, in their more permanent and fortified villages on this major waterway, carried on a pretty profitable trade with white settlers, trappers, and hunters. But the interaction with outsiders exposed them to disease, and they were nearly decimated by a string of smallpox outbreaks. By the 1800s, they had lost 
four-fifths of their population, and they never recovered their numbers. By the mid-1800s, they numbered only about 6,000 people. The Sioux, on the other hand, numbered about 22,000 in 1881. As the population fluctuated, so did the power of one tribe over the other. And in the 1800s, the Lakota began to aggressively dominate all the other tribes in the region and tried to drive them from their lands. In an effort to survive, the Arikara formed allegiance with two other tribes, the Mandans and the Gros Vents or Hidatsas near Fort Berthold, North Dakota. Fort Berthold was an old trading post that had been established in 1845. In 1851, it became an Indian reservation and it was established by the Treaty of Fort Laramie. This treaty defined the boundaries of the Hidatsas, Mandans, and Arikara nations, and they became known as the three affiliated tribes. Once this reservation was established, unlike the other tribes on the Great Plains, the three affiliated tribes never had a hostile outbreak against the United States government, but their adherence to the rules often seemed unfair as they watched the Sioux in their warlike stance against whites and enemy tribes alike receive guns and horses. Meanwhile, the three affiliated tribes continued to be besieged by their enemy. In 1854, the three tribes officially requested that the United States government intervene on their behalf, and they would need to continually request help from the army for two more decades. There was a pitched battle between Arikara hunters and several hundred Lakota in June 1858, with the Arikara suffering severe casualties. In 1862, the Arikara moved from their village near Fort Clark to a new home they called Star Village, but it was attacked and destroyed by the Sioux just a couple of months later. This is when the Arikara were forced to cross the Missouri and build new earth lodges and log houses near the allied Mandan and Hadassah at Like a Fishhook Village near Fort Berthold. In 1864, Chief White Shield said, We, the Arikara, have been driven from our country on the other side of the Missouri River by the Sioux. Arikara women were too afraid to even leave the confines of their villages to pick wild berries or fruit. The issue was still not resolved in 1870 when Chief White Shield said, when we listen to the whites, we have to sit in our villages, listen to the Sioux insults and have our young men killed and our horses stolen within sight of our lodges. So clearly the intertribal warfare between the Arikara and the Sioux was bigger than Bloody Knife and Gall. But these two men illustrate the violence on a personal level. In the winter of 1865, Bloody, Sk Bloody Knife was working as a scout, hunter, and courier for the white traders at Fort Berthold. One night as he was watching over the fort from a corn scaffold, he saw a party of Sioux arrive to trade. As the Sioux were setting up this camp, Bloody Knife recognized Gall. Bloody Knife immediately went to the commanding officer at Fort Berthold, a Captain Adam Bassett of the 4th Volunteer Infantry. Bloody Knife said, do you want the bad Sioux who has been killing all the white men found dead and scalped in lonely places along the river? And the captain responded, I do. Then Captain Bassett sent 2nd Lieutenant William Eaton with a platoon of soldiers with Bloody Knife. They surrounded Gaul's teepee. When the hunk papa warrior emerged and resisted arrest, he was bayoneted. He fell to the ground and then they bayoneted him some more. He had blood gushing from his mouth and nose and Lieutenant Eaton declared him dead. Well, Bloody Knife shouted, not yet, but I'll make him dead. Bloody Knife put his gun near Gaul's face, but just as he was about to shoot, Lieutenant Eaton kicked the gun aside and the buckshot went wild. Maybe Gaul's wives and children emerged from the teepee. I don't know, whatever the reason though, the Lieutenant ordered Bloody Knife not to shoot again. The soldiers left Gaul there on the frozen ground next to his teepee. Bloody Knife rushed back to his fellow Arikara to convince them to return and finish the job. but. 
the older tribesmen said they could not risk angering the fort's military. Well, Gaul's party didn't wait around to see what would happen. The hunk papas immediately packed up, and thanks to the help of the women traveling with them, including a medicine woman, Gaul survived. And in case you think this story is an exaggeration, Gaul himself showed Father de Smet his bayonet scars three years later, and he revealed that the attempt on his life prompted Gaul in vengeance to kill seven white men within the year. He told Father de Smet that he used those white scalps to decorate his war lamps. And another bit of evidence is the winter counts from 1865. Winter counts were the closest thing to a written language used by the Sioux and other Plains tribes. They are pictographs drawn on buffalo or deer hides and in one, with one event representing each year. In 1865, one such winter count has the pictograph, quote, Chief Gall struck with bayonet by soldier. Well, Bloody Knife understood the error in not ending Gaul's life. He later said, had the white soldier let Bloody Knife alone, his brother officer would not have been dragged by the neck to his death, back of the sentinel butts, and the eyes of the black man put out by heated iron ramrods, as was done in Gaul's camp on the head waters of Heart River. Meanwhile, young Bloody Knife continued to distinguish himself. In August 1865, General Sully wrote in his official report about a band of Sioux warriors who had made an aggressive demonstration against Fort Rice. When the general's forces went out to meet them, the Sioux retreated. However, the troops were able to follow the warriors thanks to Bloody Knife, who General Sully described as, quote, a trustworthy Indian, half a Rikara, half Hunk Papa, who followed their trail across the Badlands and found their trail still going westward toward the Powder River. Remember, Bloody Knife spoke both Sioux and Arikara. He was said to be, quote, perfect at sign language, in which he'd communicate with whites. And having been raised by the Hunk Papas, he must have had an incredible scope of information about traditions, habits, raids, hunting grounds, and all the land that the Hunk Papas traveled. In 1866, Congress authorized the U.S. military to enlist into regular service an auxiliary force of Indian service members for six-month terms of enlistments, and they were given the same pay as the white enlisted soldiers of $13 a month. Though if an Indian enlisted and had his own horse with him, he would get an additional $12 a month or 40 cents a day. The army provided clothing, including underclothing, a flannel shirt, a uniform, footwear, a firearm, and ration, rations. Some scouts lived with their families at the scout quarters of the garrison. It was also in 1866 that Bloody Knife married an Arikara woman named She Owl or Owl Woman. Bloody Knife is first mentioned as having enlisted as an army scout in May 1868 at Fort Buford. His enlistment paperwork describes him as being five feet seven inches with brown hair and eyes and a copper complexion. He served near continuous enlistments. Fort Buford was an isolated post near the confluence of the Yellowstone and Missouri rivers, often under attack by the Hunk Papas, and being an Arikara scout was a dangerous job. Bloody Knife would have seen his allegiance with the United States Army as one that also helped his Arikara people. In 1869, the three tribes asked the United States for guns as protection against hostile Sioux, and they finally received 300 pieces. Meanwhile, Bloody Knife and Owl Woman, woman had several children. One daughter died of illness in 1870 at the scout quarters at Fort Buford. The little girl was buried at Fort Buford in the, a grave that simply says, Daughter of Bloody Knife, December 28, 1879, disease. 
In the fall of 1872 at Fort Buford, there was at least four fights with the Sioux in which the Sioux deliberately provoked the U.S. soldiers just to get at their accompanying Arikara scouts. Of the 20 Arikara scouts on duty at that time, six died. Not only did Bloody Knife survive, but he was singled out in the writings of an army officer who said, Sitting Bull was the greatest enemy during this time, and the attempted several attacks, but was always frustrated by the information received from his camp through one of the Indian scouts named Bloody Knife. It was also said about the Arikara scouts during these skirmishes that they exhibited the greatest bravery and fearlessness. Even though the Arikara scouts were suffering heavy losses, Arikara chief, son of the star, still encouraged Arikara warriors to end list. Okay guys, let's give a quick look at some maps and get a sense of kind of where we're talking about. This one shows the three affiliated tribes, land and reservation. You can see Fort Buford in relation to the Arikara reservation and in relation to like a fish hook village. Here's a drawing of like a fish hook village and that's of course, where the three affiliated tribes live together, and it's quite close to Fort Berthold and about 100 miles from Fort Buford. Now, here's a map of the boundaries decided on in the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. And the area we are discussing belongs to the three affiliated tribes. Here's another. So when the Lakota are attacking the Arikara villages within these boundaries, it's the Sioux who are the ones who are trespassing. Meanwhile, the United States Army had been accompanying surveying parties from the Northern Pacific Railroad to see where it would be best to lay track westward. The U.S. Army also had an interest, of course, in this, as they planned to put forts along the new railroad routes. They were Meeting, though, with very limited success, a large swath of the land in question had been given to the Crow tribe at the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1851, and the Crow had recently ceded a part of this to the U.S. Army in 1868, but the Sioux considered it part of their prime buffalo hunting territory, and they did not want a railroad cutting through it. War parties had successfully attacked and disrupted surveying parties in 1871 and 1872, including an ambush led by Gaul himself, in which he killed Lieutenant Louis Dent Adair, as well as another officer and General Stanley's African-American cook. Well, Lieutenant Adair just happened to be the first cousin of President Grant's wife, Julia. The killing of Adair was widely publicized and caused President Grant to create a harsher Indian policy in the West. Adair's death also paved the way for the Yellowstone Expedition of 1873. And this time, Northern Pacific engineers and surveyors were accompanied by everything the United States Army had in the way of defense. In 1872, when Fort Abraham Lincoln was established, Bloody Knife had been promoted to corporal and became the leader of the Arikara Scouts at the fort. Bloody Knife was also one of Major General David S. Stanley's most trusted Indian scouts. Stanley was put in charge of the Yellowstone Expedition, which was a combination of the 22nd Infantry and the 7th Cavalry. This was larger than all of the previous surveys put together it would cover nearly 1,000 miles and take 66 days. There were 27 Indian scouts acting as guides and interpreters. Also 275 wagons, more than 2,000 horses and mules, 79 military officers, nearly 1,500 soldiers, 350 civilians. There was even a scientific corps, including a zoologist, an artist, a New York troop Tribune writer, a photographer, hmm. and President Grant's son, Lieutenant Fred Grant, decided to join the expedition. Fred Grant may have been a little pissed off about the death of his cousin, Adair, but having the president's son along must have made things a little stressful for Stanley. 
Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer led the 10 companies of the 7th Cavalry. They, the whole expedition left Fort Rice on June 20th, 1873 with the band playing music because, well, Custer always had the band playing music. This time the band left playing Arkansas Traveler. <laughs> It was on this expedition that Bloody Knife first met Custer. A fellow scout, Billy Jackson, who was a quarter Blackfoot Indian himself, quoted Bloody Knife as saying after he met Custer, that yellow haired one, he is a real chief of all the white chiefs, the greatest chief. Custer would write about this expedition and in his articles, he referred to Bloody Knife as his favorite scout. I wanna take a second guys to think about that. Custer had a lot of scouts, arguably the best scouts available, and Custer was a hunter and tracker of some renown himself. There are plenty of instances of Custer being on campaign, and when his column gets lost and his scouts can't find the way, Custer was able to figure it out. So he knew what he was talking about. And to be clear, he does not call Bloody Knife his favorite Indian scout. He calls him, quote, my favorite scout. Plain and simple, that says a great deal. And Bloody Knife was, of course, the perfect scout and guide for this expedition. He had been raised with the Sioux. He knew the country. He knew the expedition would be headed toward one of the favorite summer encampments of the Northern Lakota. The expedition's first clash with the Sioux occurred on August 4th and is called the Tongue River Fight. The huge column was moving slow and Custer and a hundred men peeled off in advance to find the best trail. Earlier that morning, Bloody Knife had discovered fresh hoof prints of warriors and he warned there might be an attack in the coming days. Well, it happened sooner than anyone expected. That afternoon with temperatures reaching 110 degrees Fahrenheit, Custer and his two companies descended into a valley to take a break in the shade of a wooded timber. And suddenly a small group of Lakota warriors tried to stampede the soldiers' horses and failed. Custer with his orderly John Tuttle and about 20 men riding behind them rode out to try and parlay with the warriors, but the Lakota refused and raced off. Custer cautiously followed, aware that the small party could be a decoy similar to the, that of the Fetterman fight. It was. Suddenly, 250 warriors rode out from a timber. One officer wrote, under any other circumstances, it would have been a beautiful sight. The Indians were dressed in brightly colored blankets and their ponies were of different hues. Their lines present, presented a brilliant appearance. Custer and his orderly, before they could be cut off from the larger body of soldiers, raced back. Custer knew he and his men were surrounded and outnumbered. He later wrote, realizing the great superiority of our enemies, not only in numbers, but in their ability to handle their arms and horses in a fight. Custer ordered a retrograde movement back into his timber, sorry, into the timber out of the open plain with his men's backs against the Yellowstone River. One warrior galloped in front of the soldier line, drawing their fire. Custer described what happened next. I was standing in a group of troopers. Bloody Knife was with us, his handsome face lighted up by the fire of battle and desire to avenge the many wrongs suffered by his people. One Sioux warrior dashed repeatedly in the front of our lines. He taunted us, riding along the lines at full speed. Bloody Knife, with his Henry rifle poised gracefully in his hands, watched his coming, saying he intended on making this his enemy's last ride. He would send him to the happy hunting ground. Custer's official report points out that it was Bloody Knife who had the first kill by shooting dead an enemy warrior as he charged the U.S. soldiers. At one point, Custer noticed smoke and asked Bloody Knife what it was. Bloody Knife replied, they are setting fire to the long grass and intend to burn us out. The Great Spirit will not help our enemies. See, the grass refuses to burn. Custer and less than 100 soldiers were surrounded and fought from this timber 
for nearly three hours. The men were starting to worry about running out of ammunition, and Custer wrote, the reader can imagine how longingly and anxiously both officers and men constantly turn their eyes to the high ridge of hills, distant nearly two miles, over which we knew we would catch the first glimpse of approaching succor. Unlike at the Little Bighorn three years later, this time relief arrived. Custer continued, a shout rose from the men. And all eyes turned to the bluffs in the distance, and there were to be seen coming almost with the speed of the wind four separate squadrons of Uncle Sam's best cavalry with banners flying and tails floating in on the breeze. One soldier later wrote, we could see Colonel Custer and the scouting party in a fight with a large band of Indians, about 300. When the Indians saw us coming, they fled up the valley and were soon out of sight. Meanwhile, while Custer was pinned down about three miles away and completely unaware of the fight ahead, two unarmed civilians, the veterinarian Dr. John Hunsinger and a trader, Augustus Ballerin, as well as one soldier, Private John Ball, were watering their horses. They were surprised by a group of Lakota warriors and they were killed. They were the only casualties on the U.S. Army side that day. After the Tongue River fight, Custer decided to try and pursue the Lakota with his now more than 450 strong 7th Cavalry. It was Bloody Knife who, riding in advance with Custer, found a recently abandoned village of about 500 lodges, which would mean about a thousand warriors. Custer got permission from General Stanley to follow this hot trail, and they did so until August 10th when they hit the 400 foot wide Yellowstone River. Bloody Knife swam across to determine if the Lakota tracks continued on the other side. They did. He urged Custer to hurry up, but the soldiers just couldn't get across. Bloody Knife was furious. He supposedly raged at Custer and the soldiers for being afraid of water, telling them they had, quote, little bird hearts. Then he started trying to teach the soldiers how to make bull boats, which were willow frames wrapped in buffalo hides so they could get across the river the next day. But at dawn on August 11th, the soldiers woke up when hundreds of Lakota started shooting both arrows and rifle fire from the other side of the river. They were also shooting off their mouths. The Lakota taunted, we're coming over to give you hell. They told the soldiers, that they had killed Hansinger and Balleran on October 4th. While the Arikara scouts were quick to shout back and Bloody Knife recognized both Gaul and Sitting Bull on the other side. The long distance shooting at each other from across the river lasted about two hours. Meanwhile, the Sioux warriors had no trouble crossing the water. They swam around and surrounded the soldiers. Lakota women and children gathered on the bluffs to watch. Custer deployed sharpshooters and small detachments of soldiers in all directions to flush out the warriors and meet each new attack. When the soldiers moved back from the water, the warriors began attacking in waves of about a hundred warriors each. Custer wrote, the Indians were made up of different bands of Sioux, principally hunk papas, the whole under the command of Sitting Bull who participated in the fight. Custer's horse was shot and he quickly got on another and kept fighting. Gaul's horse was also shot. This wasn't the only similarity between the two leaders that day. Custer often wore a red shirt on this campaign. Those of you who know about Custer's Civil War career will know he often wore a red tie in those days when he led his men into battle so his troops could see him on the battlefield. Well, Gaul was also known to wear red, so much so that one of his names was Walks in Red Clothing or Red Walker and red was his trademark color to wear in fights. Wrote the New York Tribune correspondent who was there that day, one conspicuous Indian in a red blanket, supposed to be Gaul, an important chief, had his pony shot dead under him, but he leapt on a fresh horse and got away. The hung papa warrior stood out because of his muscular frame and the familiar red blanket. The seventh suffered one casualty that day during the sharpshooting at the river. Custer's orderly, John Tuttle. Tuttle, one of the best shot of the 7th Cavalry, took his commander Springfield and killed three warriors in the distance before an Indian sharpshooter shot him in the head. 
Ultimately, the 7th Cavalry repulsed the attack against numbers of warriors with estimates ranging from 500 to 1,200. Once more, reinforcements came to Custer's aid when General Stanley and his infantry arrived with their Rodman guns and they fired artillery shells across the river. Then, in a surprising move, Custer had the band play Gary Owen and he charged the enemy, the entire 7th Cavalry, pursuing the retreating Sioux for nearly eight miles. I bet Bloody Knife was right in front with Custer, chasing after that red blanket of his most hated nemesis. All right, guys, one more time. Let's look at another set of maps here and the territory in question as this always comes up. And this time you can see that the fighting was taking place in Crow territory, not in Sioux territory. So the Sioux once more were over the treaty lines in another people's land. The last clash occurred on the morning of April 16th. 500 dirty and tired soldiers were washing their clothes and bathing themselves in the Yellowstone River when suddenly Lakota and Cheyenne snipers fired at them from Pompey's pillar. The soldiers fled for cover. There's a story about one terrified and very naked man sprinting half a mile from where he had been bathing at the water all the way through camp until he ran and hid in his tent. <laughs> I'm sure that poor guy never heard the end of it. But I bet there was one guy who didn't run. Bloody knife. The following day, the expedition broke camp and headed north into the Muscle Shell River country before returning to the Dakotas. Well guys, that's all for today. Stay tuned for the exciting conclusion. We'll discuss the controversial Black Hills expedition as well, of course, as the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Leave me a comment, subscribe, like, say hello, give me a suggestion for the next time. Uh, stick around because the credits are going to roll and I also have a book list of all of the resources I use to put this video together. Thank you. See you guys soon. Bye.